Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Sunday. You all look so beautiful and handsome. So happy to see you today. Hey, I've got a special treat for you. For those of you who don't know, my mom tickles the ivories just a little bit. Um, but it's not my style of playing at all. In fact, I wish I could play even a margin of what she plays. Um, but she's going to bless us with our first song this morning. So I get to stand away from the keyboard and, and worship with you guys today. So why don't you stand to your feet? God, we welcome you in this place. We thank you, Jesus, that, uh, that you are so faithful and so amazing. And uh, we just bless, uh, we just pray that you'll bless us today as we bless you. And uh, we just thank you um, for this day and for uh, everything that is about to happen in your house today. In Jesus' name, amen. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to earth and round God's celestial shores. I'll fly today. <laughs> Don't hold it down. She says now she's shaking. <laughs> These old fingers haven't done that for a long time. <laughs> but you know, it's when we share those gifts that maybe we haven't shared in a while. Or maybe you're asked to do something that, that you're not comfortable doing. Sometimes the biggest blessings come out of that. So don't be so afraid when you get asked to do something that maybe you just, uh, maybe you just aren't sure you're equipped for because God's going to equip you. Amen. 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 Sing like 
sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the agenda, our career, our finances, when all of those things, if we just give them over to God and put Him first, everything lines up. We're doing a new song today, and I know it's been played on the Christian radio station. It's called Graves into Gardens. And you know, we never have much up here by way of bands, so it won't sound the same. (laughs) But um, we will do the best that we can because you know what? This song speaks to my heart and I think it'll speak to your heart too. The bridge is my favorite. It says, you turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. And then it goes on to say, you turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one. 
who can. Who believes that today? Oh, come on. Who believes that today? Amen. Amen. So join with us if you're comfortable um, as we worship today. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you and I'm not afraid Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you come on and sing that again oh there's
your Lord and Savior and that he died on the cross for you, you are welcome to come up and partake. Um, this is open where you can come up at any point during the next song and take your communion. You can do it together as a family. You can do it on your own, um, whatever you feel comfortable with or led to do. Um, but let God minister to you through this communion today. Because he Daniel today. You guys know who Daniel is? 
Yeah, I know you guys know who Daniel is. Y'all better know who Daniel is. Yes. Okay. Now Daniel, who knew that his... Oh, wait, hang on, wrong page. Back up. Long ago in the land of Babylon, can you guys say Babylon? King Darius chose Daniel, the Hebrew, to be chief counselor. The Babylonian counselors were jealous because the king set Daniel over him. So they asked the king to decree that for one month, no prayers or petitions might be offered to anyone except the king. Now Daniel, who knew that his wisdom came from God, refused to stop offering his daily prayers to God. The counselors saw that their plan had succeeded and went to tell the king. Reluctantly, Darius ordered Daniel's arrest, for he dared to break his own law. The punishment for breaking the king's law was to be cast into the den of the lions. What sound does the lion make? Roar. Thank you from, <laughs> from the teenagers on the left. The counselor took Daniel in, shut him into the den. Your God may be the giver of wisdom, but now, how can he save you? How can he save you now? The king asked sadly. The door of the cave was sealed with the king's own seal, and the counselors exulted. For they thought they were rid of Daniel at last. They think the lions were going to eat him, huh? Is that what happened? No. Y'all know the end, don't you? That night, the king's heart was heavy. For he had loved Daniel and relied upon his wisdom. Darius passed a sleepless night with the first light of dawn. He arose and went in haste to open the door of the lion's cave. King Darius, may you live forever, Daniel called. Do you see? The lions have not harmed me, for I have done no wrong. From that day on, Darius revered the power of Daniel's God which is the same as our God, amen? Can y'all say amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> With Daniel's help, he ruled his kingdom wisely and well. Woo, guess what? That means we won. Yeah, everybody likes to win. All right, it's time for Surge Kids. So if you are uh, grades six and under, that even means preschoolers, you guys can come with us. Meet me out in the hallway, and we will head on down. Morning. Yeah, all right, there we, there we go. How's everyone doing this morning? Welcome to church. Great seeing everyone this morning. Wonderful worship. Thanks, guys. And uh, mom, mom, my, uh, my second mom. <laughs> Love you. You, uh, you need to do that more often, I think. Yeah. That was good. All right. Well, hey, good morning. I hope you have had a wonderful weekend so far. Um, yesterday, we celebrated Miss Dawn DeBoof's birthday. So I do want to say again, happy belated birthday at this point. Um, I won't tell you how old she is because I know that that's a rule with women. You do not do that. So happy birthday, all right? It is August 16th, which means that we are halfway through the last really warm month. Okay, I know September is still, it's still a warmer month, but come on, August to me is like the end of summer. So to be halfway done the last month that's really warm is depressing. 
Fall is always fine with all the festivities, though. The, the corn mazes and pumpkin spice everything at this point. Um, but, and look, I, I get that, all right? It, it's, it's a neat, neat time. There's a lot of fun things that happen. But I can't get into fall, personally. I just can't make it happen. You guys know what comes after fall, right? Why does everybody, oh, everybody just rallies around fall like it's the best season? And I can't bring myself to it. I can't do it because... After that, we're in the Midwest, guys. Church, this is Iowa. Ice-covered roads and six-foot snow drifts. <sighs> all right, I'll, I'll, I'll go along with it, though. All right, I'll walk and fall when it comes. I don't have a choice anyway. What am I going to do, tell it to go away? All right, let's open up here in a word of prayer and get into today's message. Father God, thank you for a lovely morning this morning. God, I thank you so much for everybody who's come out today to gather in your house for your name, to lift your name on high, to lift the name of Jesus over ourselves, over our community, God. And I pray, Lord, that you are magnified and glorified in this church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So today begins a new message series that I've entitled, The Battle for Your Mind. And we're going to be looking at this from a few different angles as we go about. Um, there are a lot of, of battles or struggles that we deal with. And I think that controlling these, these thoughts, these things that come into our mind, these battles that come along, um, is a powerful element of our own personal growth. There's a a husband and a wife talking one day about that, about controlling our thoughts and our anger. And he said to her, he said, when I get mad, you always seem to remain calm. How do you do that? How do you have that much control? And she said, I, I go and I clean the, the toilet. <laughs> he said, that's amazing. But how does that help? I don't get it. She said, I use your toothbrush. <laughs> Delana, please don't. <laughs> All right, but I had this series in mind, um, pun intended, because getting a hold of our mind, getting a hold of our thoughts, means getting a hold of everything that we are and anything that we're capable of. If Satan can get into here, if he can get into your mind, he has access to everything else. If he can get in there, it's game over because getting into your head means that he gets into everything that you hold dear, every thought that you have, every desire, every piece of you. And when this happens, it's not us that controls us. It's our fears, it's our worries, it's our habits. Your mind and your thoughts have a unique way of attracting things that are in harmony with them. Whether those things are good or whether those things are not so good. And what I think we have to do here is that we have to cultivate, the key here is that we have to cultivate a spiritually assertive mindset. So when the enemy, the accuser, comes to your doorstep and he tries to deliver a box of his lies and his charges against you, you can stop him right there and say, you can turn right around and return this one to sender. I am not accepting any of your lies and your deception over my life. I know who I am. I'm a son or a daughter of the king. I know my worth. He's going to come. He's going to try to accuse you. Try to show you your sin. Try to show you things to worry about or fear about. The irony of him doing this is that the cross already emptied all of those charges of any power. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 put it this way. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, our sin debt, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it all away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, 
triumphing over them by the cross. Hallelujah. I love that passage. The message version puts verse 15 this way. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants of their sham. Oh, sorry. Hold on. He stripped all of the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority. They're fake, they're pseudo authority. They think that they've got something, but they don't. At the cross, and he marched them through the street. How about that? He's got no authority over you, no authority over your family. Whatever charges he brings to your mind to try to accuse you, to try to make you think that you can't beat this, or that you're not good enough, or that you don't have a hope or a future. Those charges themselves are a sham. In modern day language, it's fake news, church. And Satan's the CEO. We just are not buying what he's selling. This is the First thing that I want us to keep in mind as we begin this message series is when it comes to the battle for your mind, the accuser will try to come up charging at you, but you have to understand he's got no teeth. He's been defanged. He's like a snake without poison. Yeah, he can, he can bite. Yeah, he's ugly. But there's no sting. There's no power because Jesus took that sting away when he robbed the grave of its power over us. We just sang about that a little bit. It turns graves into gardens. There's nothing left at this point but freedom and life in him. And as I was Putting this message series together, it really it weighed on my heart because there's so much, um, there's so much that we face on a daily basis that becomes a battle in our own minds. Even if we think the problem is outside of us, I think that the bigger problem ends up being that the battle is not so much external but internal. And it's often our perception that bogs us down more than the problem itself. It becomes less about what happens around us then and more about what we perceive and the thoughts that we allow into our heads. And to be clear, I meant battle when I said battle. Amen? It's a fight. It's a war. It's not easy. It's not quick. It's not going to be something we can sit down and just relax over. There are going to be days when you just want to tear your hair out and scream the thing that I want to remind us of here is that even if we lose a battle, we do eventually win the war. And that is a divine promise. You will get through this. Wars are won, though, by pressing through even after the battle is long past. Got to stay in the fight. Got to keep your eyes on him. Got to keep focused on him. I have a, a friend of mine in the Quad Cities that loves long distance running. It's not my thing personally, but he does all the marathons and uh, in the Quad Cities there's something called the Bix. He's always doing those. Um, I think he even did Ragbri at one point. But, so a lot of these endurance focused things. And I said to him one day, I said, how do you do all of that without feeling like you're gonna collapse? I get tired just looking at you. And he said, oh, I, I feel like I'm gonna collapse. That feeling's there, let's be honest. But my desire for that prize, for that finish line, is greater than my fear of the exhaustion. Yeah, so let's, let's acknowledge it. The exhaustion's there, it's a, rea it's a reality, it's a thing. But he's not got his mind on that. He's got his mind on that finish line. I'm running towards it, that's what I want. I, don't, I know that the exhaustion is there, but I'm pushing it aside. I want that finish line. I want that prize. That's still not enough to compel me to do long distance running, but you get the point, right? If Jesus is our prize, no matter 
how tough the battle gets, no matter how difficult it is when we're going through it. We can weather through the exhaustion and the pain and we can get to the goal. And that's his promise to us, is that he will see us through. We may not be able to get through on our own. And as a matter of fact, his strength is made perfect in weakness. So we do, as, as Paul said, we boast in that weakness. We say, you know what, I, I can't do it, but you know what, I know who can. There's been um, a, couple, <laughs> a couple of things on, on my side of the family, personally, that I've been um, really wrestling with this year. And not only was our, our camping trip to the Quad Cities intended to meet up with family that I hadn't seen in, in some time, but also to try to help them through some, um, some worries and some, some issues that have popped up over there that I'm not, I'm not going to get into detail about. But it's been pretty prevalent this year for us. But just as I was saying a minute ago, I'm keeping my focus on him because he's my rock and my shelter and he's seeing us through. It's not easy. But he's making it happen. He's seeing us through. And I'll get to the prize. I'll get to him and I'll get to his freedom and the redemption that he's got for us. Not keeping my mind on the pain, but I'm looking at the prize. I'm looking at the finish line. And so is the rest of the family. Go ahead and, um, excuse me. I told myself I wasn't going to tear up when I got to that point, but um, go ahead and open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And this is going to be the primary passage for this morning, um, verses 3 through 5. Beginning here in verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. All right, I want to take a look at what a stronghold is. Strongholds can be many things. They could be financial. It could be family worries that I was just talking about there. It could be many things, um, medical concerns, you name it. But our focus on this message, our, we're, we're going to keep our eyes. We're looking at strongholds in our mind. Not the things going on around us cause that mental stress, yes. But let's look internally here at our own thoughts first. And that's what I think the stronghold really lies at. We're going to be attacking this in two ways. We're going to be pulling it right off of Scripture here, taking every thought captive, and then taking those captive thoughts and making them obedient to Christ. We've already established that Satan doesn't have a right to bring charges against you, right? Every blame, every blemish, every sin that you've ever had or ever will have had was hammered to that cross 2,000 years ago. And it's amazing because we don't have to worry about our past, we don't have to worry about what's going on right now, and we don't have to worry about the future because we serve a God who was and is and is to come. His love knows no limits and his grace knows no boundaries. Not only was the sin debt completed and paid for, but every ugly thing that sin dragged right along with it was also defeated. All those feelings of insecurity, of defeat, of worry, you name it, whatever came along with it, it's gone. It doesn't have a right over you. Let's look at it this way. We wear a lot of crosses, some necklaces, clothing, t-shirts, Pants sometimes. 
The cross is a beautiful symbol of the love of Christ, right? But I also want to think about it as a tombstone. It's a tombstone for anxiety, for fear, for depression, self-doubt, for everything that sin dragged right along with it. We don't just look at it. We see the victory that's in it, but we also see it's overcoming everything that we've ever fought with. When you're raised to new life in Jesus Christ, those things have no right over you anymore. So let's take a look at the first of those two things I had mentioned. Taking every thought captive. I don't, want to, I don't want us to misunderstand that word captive. I want to make sure we get a good feeling for what it's getting at here and what it's talking about. So let me elaborate a bit on it. The Greek word here is eikmelotizo. How is that for a word, all right? Everyone, <laughs> everyone's going to have that written down for the, uh, the pop quiz at the end of the sermon, right? That word captive means it means to control, to conquer, to bring it into submission. In other words, it's that assertive mindset that I was talking about there. We need to grab hold of whatever that negative thought or that emotion is that we're wrestling with. Every fear, every worry, and conquer it and bring it down into submission underneath us. I used to be in in wrestling in junior high and a little bit of high school. Those were fun years. Um, I know, a one-handed wrestler, figure that one out. But uh, Ron, you, yeah, got some thoughts. <laughs> a little bit there on, um, on what you've done, right? Um, submissions in wrestling, though, are how you win. You want to get somebody into a position, wrestle them down and pin them down into a spot where they can't fight back, they can't do anything. You've got control over them, right? We don't just simply dance around with the opponent and just kind of hope that somebody gets tired and falls down to the mat and says, I'm done. You've got to skillfully grab hold of those critical areas. They could be uh, wrists or ankles or maybe a, a headlock or something. That's one of the reasons I think I would kind of liked it is because I've got half as many wrists as the next guy. So there's half as much potential for them to grab onto. So yes. All right. My favorite move was if you're standing up, you grab hold of the arm and kind of get it underneath their head. And if you do it just right, you hip toss them down into the mat. And if you get it just right, you hold that as you go through the motion, they're in the pin, the pin position. You don't have to do anything else. You, you got them locked. All right. That and whenever you did it, the team always jumped up because you'd hear that thud. It was just fun. But remember, I said you need to grab hold of key areas, right? To be able to put them into submission. The same applies here with your thoughts and everything that the enemy tries to bring against you. With every fear, every worry, every thought, there is something there, there's a weak point, a weakness that you can grab hold of that gives you the upper hand. And whatever that, that thought or emotion is, it, it can depend on what it is. You know, it could be maybe feelings of, um, of insecurity or not being good enough. And then when you, we'll get to this here in a minute, you start grabbing hold of the word, and when God says, no, you are a child of God, and you begin to understand the extent and the length of that and what all that means, that's the upper hand in that situation. That's when you've got that thought in control and in submission. It may not be immediate that you get that victory and you, you win, but you've got it. And if you hold on to it and you keep that focus, you'll overcome. Every thought, though, everything that we, we have that comes into our minds must come into submission to Christ. There's no exceptions. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 for God has put all things in subjection. Underline that in your Bible. All things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. That last part basically saying God himself is the exception to being put underneath God. But every 
demon, every lie, every attack on your life must bow. We're not asking for permission here. We're not hoping that maybe God wants to see us through. We're not sitting back and just hoping that we'll overcome. So he's going to walk us right through that victory door. The promise is already made, and it's simply up to us to get out there and to harvest the fruit of that promise. And then something to kind of think on here. I think sometimes we give Satan a little bit too much credit. Yes, he's there. Yes, he's on, he's on it. He's after us. He wants to get into your, your mind. But sometimes, let me put it this way. Something I've realized about strongholds is that it doesn't always take a devil to build them. Sometimes the very person putting up spiritual strongholds in our lives isn't Satan, it's us. And worse still, sometimes we're the ones who take the tools right out of his hands and hammer away, putting up those those barriers, those strongholds of negativity or, or, or fear or worry or something, anything along those lines, we're the ones taking the tools out of his hands and doing it on our own. We have got to be careful there. But to make this first point work here, I'm, I'm gonna kind of tie it all in here in a minute. But to make this first point work, to take every thought captive, there's a few things that we've got to do. Number one, don't believe everything you hear or think. Right? I was just talking to somebody the other day, and they said, I read about this or that on Facebook. And of course, because I read it on Facebook, you know it's true, right? Yeah, yeah immediately just makes it true. <laughs> but it's incredibly difficult to, to put that initial filter in place because we're emotional creatures by nature. All of us are. Um, but sometimes we're reactionary. And we take that first bit of negative news and we chew on that thing and chew on it and chew on it and chew on it. But if you can train yourself to be mindful of your own mind, your feelings, your thoughts, then you can be in control of them instead of them in control of you. The second thing here, guard your mind. Here's the second filter. Put a filter over what gets in there to begin with. Um, sometimes it's people, bad friends, maybe a, a rough crowd. This person, every time I hang out with them, it seems like I'm always doing this or I fall. Or it could be um, TV, media, maybe Facebook. Maybe we should be distancing ourselves from those things, you know? we get that filter in place, we can begin to see, ah, there's some tension between that. Maybe I should be watching a tad bit less TV. Put us, let me put it this way. What's the best way to prevent an infection? You gotta cut. You put a Band-Aid on that wound before anything can get in there and fester, right? And the same goes with your mind, church. You put a spiritual band-aid over it, we're broken creatures to begin with, so things have a tendency to creep on in. You put a spiritual band-aid on it, meditate on his word. Don't just simply read through. Maybe that'll work for the time, but to meditate on it, dwell on it. And keep that bad stuff out before it can get in there. You'll find controlling your thoughts to be a whole lot easier. A third thing here, stay humble. As human beings, something that we risk doing is that we, we hastily draw conclusions sometimes if we don't have enough information. And taking our thoughts captive, what we can do here is we can stop and say, man, my flesh, my flesh wants to believe this. I want to jump to this gun here. I want to believe that. But have I done my part for clarity? If I prayed for him, if I maybe talked directly to that person to get their perspective and say, hey, here's how I'm feeling, can we talk? Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself in compassion, 
kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Just as you wouldn't go out in public without clothes on, at least I hope not, so you don't go into your own thoughts without being clothed in compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness, and patience. Engulf yourself in that. Engulf your thoughts in your soul in those things. It gets into you and it becomes just foundational. It's like you feel the tension. And the second main point here from our primary passage in 2 Corinthians 10 is to take those captive thoughts, those thoughts that we've grabbed hold of, and make them obedient to Christ, right? And I think one of the main keys to making that happen comes directly from verse 5 itself. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. I've heard it said that the greatest distance that will ever travel in life is between the head and the heart. It's reconciling what we're feeling in our hearts with, what, with what's going on in our brain. You may feel deep down in, in your heart that you're loved by God and that he's got all these plans for you and he loves you and he cherishes you. But then your mind gets bogged down with these thoughts that creep in. So you, you, your, your heart is crying out, but your mind is saying, I, I don't have time for that. I don't know if I believe that. I'm worried about this or that. I have all these reasons and these, what, what's going on here. I just don't see how it can work out. We were just talking the other day about um, how God's math doesn't seem to make sense sometimes, but it always adds up. We demolish these arguments and these pretensions then. How do we do this? The answer is this, again, it's by, by letting his word abide in your heart. And I mean that word abide seriously. It means to let it dwell, let it get in there, let it sink in. Conform to it, meditate on it. Let it grow on you. Psalm 119.15 says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Precepts, those are his commandments, his direction for my life. I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to understand that he's got guidance in place for me for good reason. I'm going to trust his goodness and his word over my life, even when it doesn't quite make sense to me. Even if there is that tension. And then we fix our eyes on his ways. I had the privilege a couple of times of meeting the flying Melendas. Does anybody know who that is or ever heard of them? All right, tightrope walkers. It's a family that's been doing it for about 200 years now. Um, and just recently, Nick Walenda, this year, uh, Nick Walenda and his wife, Aaron Dira, um, walked over the Messiah Volcano in Nicaragua. And if you guys know where that's at, you've been to, to Nicaragua. They walked over that thing. That is absurd. You're tightrope walking to begin with, which is going to stir, scare the daylights out of me because I don't do heights, but that's an active volcano. Oh, just the thought of that. In any, in any case, I had the opportunity to ask him one time. I said, how do you get up there and walk on that rope without worrying about slipping or falling or actually falling or that to that matter? And they said this, the trick Aside from practice, of course, practice, practice, practice. And of course, don't start, you know, 20, 30 feet up in the air. Um, start low. But the key aside from practice, the trick is to find a focal point. It's an, a place where you can keep your eyes on, even when you start to feel things shift a little bit. You keep your eyes on that, and you're just focused in on it. It's like mentally what happens in your brain is that everything else that's, that's happening and kind of going around, on around you it's still there, but you're, you're continuing forward because your eyes are on that. Your brain just, it does something to your body where it enables you to keep going on that tightrope and to stay balanced. It's great advice, right? But I, I still don't understand why they chose an active volcano. It's not happening. So number one practice, how by meditating on his word and thinking on his commandments. 
thinking on his plan for our life, and then we're able to, number two, fix our eyes on his ways, his path. That's what that word means. It's not just simply his ways, it's his path, the path that Jesus would end up walking and what Jesus would end up doing. Where would the footsteps of Jesus take me? And how would I respond, or how would Jesus respond to what I'm feeling emotionally in my mind? In the 90s, it was what would, what would Jesus do? Everybody had the, the wristbands and T-shirts and everything with that on it, WWJD. When Jesus was confronted and tempted by Satan in the wilderness, have you noticed that the things that Satan tempted Jesus with were all safety nets or desires? It's ones that we end up having. Food, personal power, security, possessions. And what do safety nets do? They're intended to provide us with comfort and reassurance. And the irony of this whole situation is, again, Satan is a pseudo leader. The, fi the fact that he was offering things to Jesus that he himself, I don't think he had control of. He's acting as if he did. But I think scripture is pretty clear here that all good and perfect things come from the Father. James 1, 17. So here's the interesting part. How did Jesus fight back that temptation and the terrible thoughts that were trying to get into his mind? He used the word. He knew it. He meditated on it. It was in his bones. It was in his soul. It was part of who he was. He is the word. But that's how he defeated it. We have an absolutely amazing church here. It's an amazing church body. And I love you guys a lot. It's seeing how we've rallied around each other in time of need and supporting one another when things have gotten tough. It's been awesome. But don't be afraid to, to, or don't be hesitant to reach out when you need that help. We were talking a little bit about this in the, the Sunday Bible study um, this morning. Sometimes we, <laughs> we get our church face on it's church, it's Sunday morning, I got a smile, and what's, when somebody says, hey, how you doing this morning, what's the response that pretty much always comes out of our mind? I'm doing great, everything's fine. We wear, we wear masks in public, but sometimes we have a spiritual mask over too. Don't be afraid to reach out and get some help. We're here for each other. I love you guys like your family because you pretty much are. So let's run that race like the friend, that friend of mine I was talking about. When exhaustion sets in, we keep our eyes finished or on that finish line. We keep focused on it because we know what the prize is that lies at the end of it. Even when we feel like we're going to collapse from exhaustion, the, the footprints in the sand poem, anybody remember that? It's, it's, it's famous. When or I only saw one pair of footprints, Jesus, where were you? My child, that's when I was carrying you. When that exhaustion sets in, that's what we end up seeing. Is we're, we'll see that one set of footprints, and it's going to be his. And there's a, uh, a song by uh, Kim Walker-Smith called Just One Touch. And I've asked uh, Delana to, to do this for our closing song here. But I'll give you some of the lyrics here real quick. I want you to really think on, these, on what this is saying here. This song's been on my heart lately. My soul won't rest till I find rest in you. For there is no peace, no freedom apart from you. Here, at the end of me, you are my victory. I'm trading my scars. I'm trading everything for all that you are for just one touch. It's time for rest. It's time to trade those scars in. The things that are weighing on you today, leave them at the cross. As we, we close here, if you do need any prayer, if you need somebody to talk to, as I was kind of mentioning there, I'm here. The church is here. Please come talk to us. Come talk to me. I need you to pray for me. I've got this going on. I've, I've been silent about it, but I finally got to open up. Things are cracking. I need to let, I need to let somebody in. We'll continue with part two of this message series next Sunday. Let's go ahead and close here in prayer and then go to the song. Jesus, we adore you. 
We love you. We're so thankful for your love for us, God, and for your goodness, God, that when things do get tough, that you can carry us, Lord. And as we seek you and seek to know you more, and as we dive into your word, Lord, I pray that we take that word and we guard it. We use it as a, a, a spiritual band-aid over our lives and as a, a filter, some, some protection to keep the enemy out. Just because he's defanged doesn't mean we're not gonna see him charging at us. That gets scary. But Lord, you're above all. There's nothing that you are subservient to. You are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We lift your holy name up today, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing this last song, I'd encourage you guys, just close your eyes and let the Lord minister to you. I have searched the earth when all that was needed was just one touch. My heart was racing, my heart is changing as I feel your love. My soul won't rest till I find rest in you. For there is no peace, no freedom apart from you. Here at the end of me, you are my victory. I'm trading my scars for all that you are, for just one touch. With arms stretched open wide, come set your heart. I'm here at your feet, Jesus, I need just one touch. My joy overflows from all of your beauty revealed to me. I will not move, speak for your spirit is life to me my soul won't rest until i find rest in you there is no peace no freedom apart from you For all that you are, for just one touch, with arms stretched open wide, come set your heart in mine. I'm here at your feet, Jesus, I need just one touch. I have been longing, I have been yearning, reckless abandon, surrender to you. I have been longing, I have been yearning, reckless abandon, surrender to you.
Jesus, I need just one touch. I'm here at your feet. Jesus, I need just one touch. Amen. If you need that one touch today, come talk to somebody and they can help you. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, he is bigger than anything that's before you. Just one touch. All right, y'all, you guys are released to go have an awesome Sunday. And I just pray for a time of restoration today for you guys. Ready for your next week. We love you guys. Have a good week.